The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a student and an advisor talking about facilities at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi. I wonder if you could help me. I'm starting a course at Glenfield in a few weeks. I was just a bit worried about what facilities there will be and what I'll have to do. I'm especially interested in health and welfare stuff. Certainly. We normally send out a copy of our leaflet, Staying Healthy at Glenfield. I'm not sure why you haven't had it. Well, could you answer a few questions for me? Firstly, I'm wondering about how I get a doctor when I arrive. Well, you can register with the University Health Centre on North Campus. And do I have to pay for that? Not to register, but if you have to get medicines, there's a prescription charge of £6.50. OK. Well, I'm not planning to get ill. That's only going to arise if I have any problems. So, should I just go along when I arrive? That's what we recommend for peace of mind. But it's not compulsory, and if you don't live inside the catchment area, you can't, in fact, register there. Where do you live? Well, at the moment I'm staying at the Backpackers Hostel in Hill Street, but I will be moving from there shortly, somewhere nearer. Well, there's a map at the centre which shows you the area that the university practice can accept people from. It's what we call the yellow zone. If you live outside that area, you have to find another medical centre to register with. It sounds like I'll only qualify after I move. I think you might be right. Then, in addition to the health centre, there's a free counselling service for all students situated on the North Campus. You don't have to register. They also have drop-in sessions. I say it's free, but that's only for up to eight sessions. Beyond that, they normally refer people elsewhere. Sounds serious. Well, it's not just for big problems. People go there for advice on housing, workload, whatever, really. They can even arrange financial help. Mm. Uh, is it confidential? Absolutely. Then again, a lot of students prefer to phone the Nightline service, which is run from an office on the central campus. They don't really encourage people to drop in. I see. So it's basically a free phone line. The number, if you want to make a note, is 0900 762 5913. I'll say it again. 0900 762 5913. Fine. Well, I hope I won't need any of these. What I will want is access to some gym facilities. Right. Well, you'll find those on the South Campus in the Sports Centre. It's great, but it's not free. You have to present your student card and pay a fee of £22 to get a pass. But that will last you for the whole year. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Is this information on the website? I'm afraid not. I can send you some leaflets or even resend the whole information pack if you give me your details. Uh, could you send the whole information pack, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll have to take down some details. Could you tell me your full name? Sonia Orr. S O. N Y uh, no I'll spell it S O N I A 
then or is O-R-R. -R. Or. OK. And you said you were on Hills Road. Yes, but don't send it there as I'm about to move. I'll give you my new address, which is 22 Winter Gardens. That's Glenfield. And the postcode? Oh, yeah. That's GF23 9BQ. Fine. Now, we're doing a bit of data collection about who uses our services at the moment. Can I just ask a few more questions? Yes, that's fine. OK. If you're an international student, what country are you from? I'm from Switzerland. And how old are you? I'm 24. And finally, which course are you enrolled on? Right. Well, that's a bit complicated, since I'm hoping to switch to economics and history. But at the moment... I'm down to do economics and sociology. It's a joint degree. OK, I'll put that. Great. Well, I'll pop the information pack in the post, and you should get it soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide welcoming a group of visitors to the British Library and telling them about the library and what they will see there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your very own tour of the British Library on this lovely afternoon. My name is Tony Walters, and I'm your guide for today. Could I please see your tickets for the guided tour? I'd also like to remind you that any tickets bought today do not include a visit to the reading rooms. I'm afraid we don't do visits on Fridays, or any weekday during working hours, so as not to disturb the readers. But if you do want to see those rooms, the only day there are tours is on Sundays. So, I don't want anyone to be disappointed about that today. OK? Thank you. Right, we'll start with a brief introduction. As many of you know, this is the United Kingdom's National Library. And you can see that this is a magnificent modern building. It was first designed by Sir Colin St. John Wilson in 1977 and inaugurated by Her Majesty the Queen more than 20 years later in 1998. As you can see, the size is immense and the basements alone have 300 kilometres of shelving and that's enough to hold about 12 million books. The total floor space here is 100,000 square metres, and, as I'll show you, the library houses a huge range of facilities and exhibition spaces, and it has a 1,000 staff members based here in the building. So, you can appreciate the scale of our operation. In fact, this was the biggest publicly funded building constructed in the United Kingdom last century. It is still funded by the government as a national institution, of course, and it houses one of the most important collections in the world. The different items come from every continent and span almost 3,000 years. The library isn't a public library, though. You can't just come in and join and borrow any of the books. Access to the collections is limited to those involved in carrying out research. So it's really a huge reference library for that purpose, 
and anyone who wants to consult any materials that are kept here can formally apply to use the library reading rooms. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right, well, here we are, standing at the meeting point on the lower ground floor, just to the right of the main entrance. I've given you all a plan of the building so that we can orientate ourselves and get an idea of where we'll be going. Now, Outside the main entrance, you'll see the wide piazza with the stunning sculpture of Newton. The sculptor was Paolozzi, but it's based on the famous image by William Blake, and it's definitely worth a closer look. On the other side of the piazza from the statue is the conference centre, which is used for all kinds of international conventions. We'll take a quick look inside at the end of our tour. Looking ahead of us now, you'll see that we're standing opposite the staircase down to the basement where you'll find the cloakroom, and to the left of that we have the information desk where you can find out about any current exhibitions, uh, the times of the tours and anything you need to know if you don't have a tour guide. As you can see, on this lower ground floor we also have a bookshop. That's the area over to the left of the main entrance. You'll be free to browse there when we get back to the ground floor. Now, opposite the main entrance on this floor, we have the open stairs leading up to the upper ground floor. And at the top of them, in the middle of the upper ground floor, you can see a kind of glass-sided tower that rises all the way up through the ceiling and up to the first floor. This is called the King's Library. It's really the heart of the building. It was built to house the collection that was presented to the nation in 1823 by the king. You can see it from every floor above ground. When we go up there, you'll find the library's treasures gallery on the left. Uh, can you find it on your plan? That's the exciting one. <laughs> so we'll be visiting that first, but we'll also take a look at the stamp display situated behind it on the way to the cafe. Uh, a lot of people miss that. The cafeteria runs along the back of the floor and in the right-hand corner you'll find the lifts and toilets. <laughs> Always good to locate them. The other main area on that floor is the public access catalogue section and I'll show you how that operates when we get up there. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing the subject of rock art. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, David. Oh, hi, Mia. Sorry I'm a bit late. Oh, no problem. Thanks for agreeing to help me with my assignment today. I really needed to go over it with someone. Sure. 
You were going to talk about European rock art, weren't you? Yes, the rock drawings in the caves of Lascaux in western France. Oh, fantastic! Over thirteen thousand years old, I believe. What sort of drawings are they? They're drawings of animals, on the whole, but you can also find some human representations as well as some signs. There are roughly six hundred drawings at Lascaux. Really? Were they mostly pictures of bulls? Well, no, actually. The animal most depicted was the horse.、Mm. Have a look at this graph.、Mm. It shows the distribution of the different animals. You see, first the horse, and then after that a sort of prehistoric bull. Oh, okay. That's interesting, isn't it? And the third most commonly drawn creature was the stag. There were some other animals, but these are the main ones. What are the drawings like? I mean, what sort of style? Well, the bulls are depicted very figuratively. They're not very realistic. They're very big by comparison to the other drawings of people and signs. They appear to be almost three-dimensional in some cases, following the contours of the cave walls. But of course, they're not. Amazing. Perhaps they felt these animals were the most impressive and needed to be represented like that. Yeah, maybe. The drawings of humans, by contrast, consist of just simple lines, like the stick figures my little sister draws. Perhaps humans were seen as less important. Hmm. Perhaps. What about the signs? How did they draw them? There doesn't appear to be much evidence of signs, and those that have been found are usually made up of little points. Rather like Aboriginal art from Australia. Yes, something like that, but not as complex, of course. So, apart from the bulls and horses and stags, were there any other creatures depicted? In one or two chambers, you do find pictures of fish,、oh. but they're quite rare. What sort of size is the cave? It must be quite large to have that many pictures. Well, it's actually a number of interlinking chambers, really. Here's a map showing where the different drawings can be found. Oh, good. Let's have a look at that. The first twenty meters inside the cave slope down very steeply to the first hall in the network. That's called the Great Hall of the Bulls. Here, okay. Then, off to the left, we have the painted gallery, which is about thirty meters long and is basically a continuation of this first hall. But further into the cave. Exactly.、Oh. Then we find a second lower gallery called the Lateral Passage. This opens off the aisle to the right of the Great Hall of the Bulls. It connects the next chamber with an area known as the main gallery. At the end of the main gallery is the chamber of felines. There are one or two other connecting chambers, but there's no evidence of man having been in these rooms. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Is the cave open to the public today? Well, no, because after the initial discovery in nineteen forty, it was opened and literally millions of people came through to see the drawings.、Uh. Then, in the fifties, the experts started to worry about the damage being done to the drawings, and the government finally closed the Lascaux cave in nineteen sixty-three. Is that so? It wasn't really the tourists that were doing the harm, but the fact that after thousands of years the cave was suddenly open to the atmosphere, and so bacteria and fungi started to destroy the pictures. You need a special permit to enter the cave now, and very few people can get that, unless they're scientists or have some official status. It's a shame, but I can see that they had to do something to protect the cave. So that means you can no longer see this rock art. Well, not exactly. What they've done is recreate the drawings in a man-made cave, which you can visit. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, the authorities decided to reproduce the two best sections of the site, so they've created a life-size copy of the Hall of the Bulls and of the painted gallery. It's just a cement shell, which corresponds in shape to the interior of the original. 
So now you can visit the caves without actually harming any of the 15,000 year old paintings.、Mm -hmm. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex or T. rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact: almost every one of those T. Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have twenty sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realize an obvious fact. Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes. But it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. So. Given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria: one, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones, and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilized. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft, fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilize, and from the skeleton alone, we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilization is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilized and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the Earth for a long time, and the longer, the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily. 
and being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years in fact, one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T-Rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.